As an adult, a place that you loved as a young boy might appear entirely different to you and turn out to be a disappointment. Or it might remind you of what you once were but no longer are, becoming a cause for great sadness. I wasn't that keen to find out how it would be, but there was this property that I'd been left and curiosity got the better of me. I went there at the end of April, alone, in my father's car. It was evening and climbing up the valley, I could only see the areas illuminated by the lights. Even so, I noticed several changes. The points at which the road had been improved and widened, the protective netting over the escarpments, the piles of felt tree trunks. Someone had started to build little villas in a Tyrolese style, while someone else had started to extract sand and gravel from the river, which was shored up now between cement banks, where it at once flowed between stones and trees. The second homes in darkness, the hotels closed out of season or shut for good, the immobile bulldozers and the excavators with their arms stuck in the ground gave the landscape an air of industrial decline, like those building sites left semi-abandoned due to bankruptcy. Then just as I was letting myself feel depressed by these discoveries, something called out for my attention, and I leaned over towards the windscreen to look up. In the night sky, some white shapes emitted a kind of aura. It took me a moment to realize they were not clouds. They were mountains, still covered in snow. I should have expected it in April, but in the city, the spring was already advanced, and I was no longer accustomed to the fact that to go up high is to go back a season. The snow up there consoled me for the squalor in the valley. And then I realized that I had just repeated one of my father's typical gestures. How many times had I seen him, while driving, lean forwards and look up at the sky to check the state of the weather, to study the side of a mountain, or to just admire its outline as we passed it? He placed his hands together high up on the steering wheel and rested his temple on them. I repeated the gesture aware this time of the similarity, imagining myself as my father at 40, having just turned into the valley, with my wife sitting beside me and my son in the back seat, looking for a good place for the three of us. I imagined my son sleeping. My wife was pointing out villages and particular houses, and I was pretending to be listening. But then, as soon as she was looking the other way, I would lean forward and look up, heeding the powerful call of the peaks. The more towering and menacing they looked, the more I liked them. The snow up there was most promising. Yes, perhaps on that particular mountain, there would be a good place for us. U bent hier uh, op twee manieren eigenlijk bij een uh, experiment. Een experiment voor ons om het hier te organiseren. Een literaire ontmoeting tussen Paolo Cognetti en Lirica. En u bent hier ook bij een sneak preview voor ons nieuwe logo. Die op de allereerste die het ziet. Um, de balen literair wordt een lijn die we daarin uh, gaan voortzetten. Er komen ook andere uitingen. Maar um, dit is de eerste keer dat we hem presenteren. Het is ook de eerste keer dat we hier um, uh, zelf programmeren. Een literaire ontmoeting tussen Tom Lirica en Paolo Cognetti. Voorgezeten door onze baarledacteur Jan de Mosselman, die deze avond geproduceerd heeft en een lange reeks van ontmoetingen georganiseerd heeft met schrijvers die hier writer resident zijn. Een ontzettend fijne samenwerking met het Nederlands Letterfonds. En uh, we zijn blij met die samenwerking en daar is die echt een prachtige, mooie avond voor. Ik hoop dat u uh, een goede conversatie kunt vinden. Nou, <tie> Hello, good evening. 
Um, I will switch to uh, English because otherwise Paolo Cognetti is unable to understand me and maybe there's also English speakers in this room. Um, my name is Janta Mosselman, I'm a program editor in the Bali uh, and I'm really happy that you're all here and I'm also really happy that uh, Tommy Biringa and Paolo Cognetti are here tonight because I think they're two uh, amazing writers and I am very honored that they, uh, they wanted to come and join us. Um, so Paolo Cognetti, I think you might have all read his book, The Eight Mountains. It was translated into 39 languages. Um, it's been nominated for the European Literature Prize. Uh, I think it was on the, Italy, in the, on the Italian bestseller list for about a year. Um, and recently also another one of his books uh, appeared in the Dutch translation, De Buiten Jonge. Um, and if you haven't read that yet, I would highly recommend you do so, because I really loved both books. Um, and he's going into conversation with Tommy Wieringa, who is one of our greatest writers. Um, you might have read Joe Speedboat. Um, this ain't the name, these are the names for which he uh, won the Libris Literature Prize. Um, or more recently, uh, The Heilige Rita, The Holy Rita. Um, I just finished it, um, and... I thought it was amazing how a book could be so funny and at the same time um, very touching and also quite sad. Um, so I look forward to discussing um, uh, that with him as well. Um, there are a few other things that I would like to tell you. You just heard uh, Jochem uh, ten Haaf, an actor who you might have seen on television or cinema, uh, reads a bit from the Eight Mountains. He will do that during this evening. Um, you also might be having your phone still on. If you do, please uh, switch it to silent, but you can Twitter along using the hashtag the Bali. Um, and then, of course, you're a very knowledgeable and well-read audience. So uh, in case you might be wondering, do I get to ask a question as well? Um, I can tell you, yes, you will. Uh, at the end of the program, uh, you'll be able to ask questions. But since you're so... Uh, well read. I probably don't have to ask to, to tell you what a question is. Um, having said that, uh, I would really much like to uh, ask and invite Tommy Miringa and Paolo Cognetti to the stage um, and ask you to give them a really warm applause. And now I did do forget something, because Paolo asked me to introduce Lucky to you. <laughs> she is six years old, and she was meant he to... He He, I'm sorry. <laughs> and he was meant to be a hunter, um, but then that didn't really work out for him. Uh, no, he was meant to be a shepherd, and then he was more of a hunter, so it didn't really work out with, uh, yes. with the shepherding. And then you adopted him. Yes, five years ago. And uh, we are always together, as, as you see. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if I can start with a question, we just heard Jochem uh, read about the first time that um, uh, Pietro, the main character, goes into the mountains. Yeah. Can you tell us what he's looking for? In that uh, chapter, he's looking for the memory of uh, his father, because uh, the mountains was uh, the place of his uh, childhood, like in, in my life, and... Uh, <laughs> Like he's a little bit excited, but now. Um, so he's looking for his, his father, but also his childhood, his own memories, the place uh, where um, he feels that uh, he, he belongs to. Because uh, he's, a, he, he's a man, uh, um, he's a ruthless man. And uh, he needs a place uh, well, where uh, he, he can feel at home. I'm, I'm sorry for my poor English. I spent a lot of time in New York City, but I was too shy for uh, <laughs> speaking with anyone. So I, okay. I didn't learn <laughs> You're fine. a lot of, lot of words. <laughs> Thank you. And you went, you went to live in, to, in the mountains yourself. Yes. I live up there in Valle d'Aosta. Valle d'Aosta... Uh, is well known by Dutch people because I, I meet a lot of Dutch in the mountains. It's on the northwest of uh, Italy, on the border with France, and we have the highest mountains uh, in the Alps. 
And uh, ten years ago, I I looked for a for a place. I was in the middle of a crisis, of a personal crisis. There was also a a, a bigger a bigger crisis in the world because uh, we were in the middle of the of a financial crisis. I was uh, without a uh, job, and uh, with my girlfriend, uh, things uh, weren't so perfect. And um, in the day of my 30th birthday, I went to the cinema to see Into the Wild. Into the Wild, uh, <laughs> I know it can be funny, but uh, I have two films that uh, changed my life. The first was... Uh, the Dead Poets Society, mm-hmm. when I was uh, 16, and I started to think that uh, I could be a writer. And uh, when, when I was 30 and so sad uh, that uh, I was in the cinema uh, alone, uh, I saw Into the Wild, that, and, I, and I remembered of that mountains of my, of my childhood. And so um, I thought that maybe it was the place where uh, I, can, I could uh, start again start a new life. But Into the Wild, if I remember the ending well, it's quite lonely and sad as well. The end, but yes. not the beginning. No, the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> so it was the beginning that motivated you. Yes. But were you not afraid of the loneliness? Yes, but uh, I, I know quite well the loneliness. Also in a big city. Also in Milan, also in New York. And uh, it's like a companion. Uh, sometimes it's sad. Sometimes things uh, go better with loneliness. <laughs> and uh, I needed uh, loneliness in that, uh, par- in that uh, age of my life. Do you recognize that, Tommy? Loneliness? Yes, <laughs> and, and needing that in your life? Of course. Um... I just spent six weeks with my wife and children. (laughs) (laughs) And then you need some. A lot, yes. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And when you write, do you go into a period of solitude, for instance? Oh, yes, and and, and I think... um, not only solitude, but also emptiness. Uh, um, I find it difficult to write in cities. I'm, 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 I'm distracted all the time. Uh, Paolo's spending a month here in Amsterdam, uh, I think above a bookstore called Atheneum, right? Yes. Oh, that's, that must be hell. <laughs> I mean, if you're from the mountains, and then with all these trams <laughs> and these drunkards, the English drunkards, and that must be terrible. I think you'll you'll long for your solitude, <laughs> yeah. but um, no. Um, so so I I, I need uh, solitude and emptiness and emptiness in a in a in a physical way, um, for uh, for a book which I wrote on uh, a few years ago. Uh, these are the names. I went to uh, to Ukraine in order to find some emptiness. Um, For the Heilige Rita, Saint, Saint Rita, I, um, I went to, to Twente, which is more or less the beginning of the Ukrainian steppe. <laughs> um, but it's the only, it's the only empty, empty spaces which you can find in the Netherlands, because we're, we're overcrowded delta. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's actually a punishment to be born in the uh, in Netherlands if you look for emptiness or solitude. So it's yeah, it's. Uh, I envy. After having read the Eight Mountains, I envy. Uh, even I would have never thought I would envy Italian writers, but I do now, because you have. Space and different landscapes and uh, emptiness, physical emptiness, which, yeah, which I'm always looking for. Because oh, if you're not saying no, no, anything, no. I'll just no. Go you on. continue. <laughs> no, I was think, I was think, I was thinking about what you said because I was wondering if you ha- if you try it every now and then still to write in the city or 
And what happens there? Well, yes, I did. I did. Uh, I, I wrote part of the novel in New York, uh, but that was on a, on a mount, in a mountain-like uh, uh, environment because it was on the 14th floor. <laughs> And uh, I only transported cups of coffee up and donuts from Dunkin' Donuts, and that was my life. So um, I spent all my time secluded and high up, which was fantastic. So that worked. That worked. Yeah, yeah. Do you write in the city? Yes, I also used to write in uh, in a New York uh, cafe. You know, it's a typical New York thing because uh, apartments are so small and uh, and busy of people. So you go down and uh, take a coffee and write in the middle of a uh, crowded uh, cafe. Uh, New York is like the, the, the Los Angeles of writers. The waiter can be the new great uh, American writer. And uh, you are there. Uh, you Yesterday night on Spooy Square, I... Spooy is correct? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I um, spent uh, the night uh, between uh, one and two looking out the, the windows and uh, looking at the people, the waiter that uh, closed the, the bars. I like the cities. Uh, I just feel like uh, I am split in two parts. One wild boy that uh, needs uh, the mountains and one urban boy that uh, likes... Uh, <laughs> Not, not the city, but the people, the, the possibility to, to meet people. That, that's the thing that I miss more in the mountains. You said that you were lonely in both the city and the mountains um, around your 30s. Was it, is it a different loneliness? Yes, because uh, the, the, the loneliness of the mountains is your uh, choose. You, you, you choose the loneliness. The, the loneliness of the cities are like a prison. And um, you are in, you are not able to to to, to speak with others. And uh, I have uh, many teachers. One of my teachers is uh, Mario Rigoni Stern. He's an, he was an Italian writer, our most important mountains writer. And uh, he used to say that uh, in the woods you can't uh, feel uh, lonely because uh, the woods, the mountains are full, full, full of life. Uh, different, different life from yours, but uh, you, uh, you have to become able to hear the life of the woods. And um, the first uh, days, the first uh, weeks in the mountains for me are uh, now like a training for my uh, sense, senses. Mm. Uh, and uh, I need to learn again to hear and see uh, the lives around me. Would you like to ask? Um, no, I'm fine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, in, the, in the book, in the Eight Mountains, the father of Pietro moves to the city, and then um, he's not really happy there, and humans have done that for the last centuries, I think, more and more of us are moving to the cities. And you already said as a writer you need emptiness. No, not as a writer, uh, uh, just me. You just, yes. yes. Okay, but you as uh, a writer, you, yeah. you need that to, to, to write. Um, do you think we as humans lost something when we started to live so close together? No, that, that, that's, that's of course this famous saying which says that, that city air is free air. Uh, city life meant that people didn't have to um, scrape their lives from the from the earth. I mean, that, that there's more intellectual uh, work to be found here. Uh, you can you can spend the whole day behind the screen. It's wonderful. Um, of course, I am I'm, I'm trying not to be too nostalgic about uh, um, the, the, the transformation from uh, rural urban from rural life to urban life, um, but um, I could I, 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 I find it difficult to um, to choose when I'm in a city, 
to choose from uh, what to write about. I like uh, surroundings where if somebody hits his car, slams his car into a, a lantern pole, uh, that is the topic for a week, or maybe two weeks, people talk about that. Mm -hmm. Why is that? What happened? Um, what, who was this man? And, and so, so I'm, I'm more interested in uh, isolated uh, things that occur. And here I find, um, maybe, uh, maybe I'm autistic, I find it difficult to choose. To choose between yes. so many things. Yes, and, and too, too much, too much uh, input. And I admire, I mean, uh, uh, I admire writers who can do that, but I, I couldn't. I only wrote one short little novella about a man who lives in a city, but that was about the, 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 the maximum I could do, a novella. But a novel is impossible. Do you have to say that there's too many things coming at you in the city? Um... Did you grow up in the city? Yes, I was you born did. and raised in Milan. So yeah. uh, now everyone said to me, says to me that in Spoo Square there, there is too noise uh, to sleep, but uh, I, I'm sleeping perfectly oh, yeah. because okay. yeah. I was <laughs> born on the Milano Circonvallazione that is a big yeah, yeah. Uh, road uh, full of uh, yeah. cars. And uh, the noise of a city is like a lullaby, a lullaby for me. Mm. And the silence is uh, something very different. Uh, I, I, in the first days in mountains, I, I can't sleep for mm. two silence. And um, in our valleys, in the Alps, uh, uh, after uh, the last war, in, during the 50s, the 60s, uh, that place has lost uh, 80 or 19 percent of the population. Um, We had uh, another great writer that was uh, Nuto Revelli that made a lot of, lot of uh, interviews to the last uh, uh, people of the mountains before they disappeared. Because uh, we built uh, the, our big uh, factories in Milano, in Torino, and uh, all the people came down, uh, went down from the mountains. So we have these uh, ghost mountains i went up uh, 10 years ago with the illusion to find my Alaska, my, the place of Into the Wild. Mm -hmm. But after a while, I started to see that uh, the Alps uh, are not a, a wild place. Are, are, a, are a place that um, is, is becoming wild again mm. after uh, that people uh, go away, went, went away. So in the woods you can, you can see the little walls, the canals, the ruins of the, uh, the houses. Human remains. Yes, it's yeah. like a cemetery. Yeah. And um, you have to become able to read this uh, language of the abandoned. Nu ben jij, ja? Nu moet jij even Ja, weet ik, maar ik laat af en toe even. Okay. Ik ons even ademhalen. What I found When you very... want, I can sing a song. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I always get taught that it's good to, if you sometimes just take a moment and okay. let everybody... Okay, now of... <laughs> when it's policy, it's okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's something interesting in, your, in both your books that I found, uh, I found quite a similarity, because Bruno... The, the boy that Pietro meets in the mountains, he's unable to leave. He wants to remain mm. in these mountains. And then there's Paul Kruger. Krug, Kruger. Ik weet niet meer. It's an oe umlaut. <laughs> oh, Kruzen. Kruzen, ja. Yeah, yeah. um, he gets, he's, he's the main character of the Heilige Rita. Yeah. And he gets homesick when yes. he leaves. He, yes. he, he wants to stay in the, the village that he's yeah. born. So I was wondering... Most people I know travel. Do you know people who need to stay in the same place? Well, yeah, but, but it's all about migration these days, and it's all about, about people leaving uh, rural, rural areas and, and leaving to the city. And, um, but most people stay where they are. Uh, 97% of the world population stays where, stay where they are. Why? Why do you think? Because they were born there. And uh, they have their friends there, and the parents are buried there, and the grandparents, and that, that, it, it means something to be born somewhere. Um, so, 
it's this idea which, which, which newspapers and also literature gives us that everybody is on the move all the time and that everybody leaves the place where he's born, but most of the people just stay where they are, where they're from. And um, I, I played rugby in, in Dwingelo for a long time and I met some of these poetic souls there who wanted to leave Dwingelo. Dwingelo is a beautiful Brinkdorp. <laughs> you uh, can go there, maybe. <laughs> yes, you have a Fiat Panda, I understood. Yes. <laughs> so you can go to Dwingelo. <laughs> I, I re- strongly recommend it. It's a beautiful Brinkdorp in Drenthe. And um, I met some of these poetic rugby players there, big guys, who wanted to leave Dwingelo. And one of them always talked to me about uh, my travels, and he was very jealous, and he said, how is it in Bogota, how is it in uh, Brazzaville? And finally he sold the house on the brink, which was built by his grandfather, which still had bed stay, which was these built-in beds, which were they used uh, in, in earlier times. And he sold all of it and went on a... Uh, trip which would take him all over the world and funny thing is he went north first in Copenhagen he met a girl stayed there and finally came back to Dwingelo (laughs) with this girl where he still is never got further than Copenhagen and I found it so tragically poor yeah and, and, and poetic in a way uh, like the saying says, you can, you can take uh, the boy out of the village, but never the village out of the boy. Um, you said the home means something to people. Yes. What does your hometown mean to you? Uh, I don't have a hometown. I was born in uh, Goor. Mm. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> which is in Twente, <laughs> near to the German border. Interesting, wild... And a, a, yeah, place. A lot of anarchists live there. And um, the law doesn't play a, play play a role there. Whereas not as much as it does here. People pay taxes, but they don't uh, abide the law. It's interesting. You don't ever see police there. Um, so I was born there, and then we went to the to the to the Dutch Antilles. I grew up on the island of Aruba, and then mm-hmm. we came back and. Uh, I went. I made a slow trip from Twente to Drenthe to Groningen. So I don't ha- really have a hometown, but the town where the Heilige Rita is situated in is a, it's, it's a small village. That's where I, uh, I spent quite maybe seven years, and that's where the inspiration came from because I um, I continued visiting Geestre when I uh, when I grew up, and I saw the changes there and how. Uh, also people left, but also the people that stayed. And I visited the boys which I'm, um, I went uh, to school with, the Catholic boys' school. Um, they stayed. And I found it interesting. And I, I, with this book, I, I sort of imagined what would have happened to me if I would have stayed, if my father and I would have stayed in this isolated uh, farmhouse together, like uh, Paul Kruse does. Yeah. And why did you keep coming back there after you left? Because of the characters. There are yeah. amazing characters which you find there. Um, one of them was the, the car philosopher. He was a genius um, and he kn- knew all about cars. Uh, so he could fix everything. And um, he was also APK Keurmeester. <laughs> and he considered uh, fixing cars like uh, an and, and I know that this, this this goes too far. That's uh, but, uh, but uh, beautiful characters. characters. Yes, and he told me all about. I uh, know that. Okay, so but it's mainly the characters and the landscape. The landscape is is, is amazing. I like I like the, the. It's called the Coulisse Landschap. Yeah, I don't know how to translate that. And for God's sake, learn Dutch. Um, <laughs> Coulisse Landschap. Wie? Iemand? Welke tuin architect hier? <laughs> Landschap. Now it's a landscape which consists of different layers, like a layer of trees, then a, a, a meadow, again trees, and it's like a maze. Like behind every uh, uh, 
Behind every ja, hoe zeg je dat? Een haag van bomen. Mm. My English is not that good either. <laughs> Jawel, prima. Um. Ja, hoezo either? Mijn Engels is heel goed. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> maar niet zo goed dat je haag van bomen nee, kan vertalen. Haag, yeah, okay. so, but, but behind every uh, line of trees you, you suspect something else. So it's a very um, poetic landscape in my... So I went back because of the landscape also. Do you go back because of characters? Are there certain places where you find these characters that you like to describe? Yes. Uh, well, the character of Bruno is inspired uh, by uh, my best friend. Uh, his name is Remigio. And uh, I think that uh, this novel uh, uh, couldn't exist without him. So it's also dedicated to him because uh, it's uh, to the friend who inspired it, uh, guiding me where uh, there is no fat. And um, at the beginning of, the, of this story, there was a uh, remigio and uh, his uh, old uh, ruin house on the mountains that uh, he brought me to, to, to see. And uh, I started to see the story uh, hiking with him in this uh, small valley between the, the village of Gren. Gren in the novel is the fictional uh, village of Grana. But it's the same place uh, for people that live there. Uh, after that, uh, in the 50s, they were uh, 200. Now they are four. Really? <laughs> wow. A lot of uh, empty houses, an old school, empty, uh, a small church, a castle, and this valley that uh, uh, goes up uh, to, the, to the lake and to, the, to a mountain. And uh, Remigio's mother uh, on, uh, on uh, uh, an old uh, alpeggio, a mountain house, where um, she used to, to go during the summer with uh, cows when uh, she was um, a girl. Now she's uh, 87, I think. And uh, I started to think uh, of my father when uh, I was a child. And uh, we lived uh, in the valley, in the same valley, and uh, went to the same lake with my father. And so the, the parts of the story uh, were getting together, you know. Uh, I think that as a writer, you, you, I feel that uh, I can't really invent anything, but I start to see a story uh, that uh, comes from uh, my life or my friends. I also found uh, um, a place where uh, uh, a man uh, died years ago on, the, on that path and uh, on a, on a um, sign there was uh, just the, the, his name, the years of birth and death and the word Montanaro. It uh, is a word that... Uh, uh, we can find the, the translation in English because mountaineer is uh, someone that uh, go to the mountains. Mm -hmm. Montanaro in Italian in, is uh, someone who was born mm -hmm. and lives yeah. in the mountains. So I started to ask uh, to the people who this uh, Giuseppe was and I learned the story of that man that uh, missed so much uh, uh, is a small cabin on the lake that uh, during the winter uh, he used to, to go up there for some days and night and uh, one day he died under a, an avalanche. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, another part of the story. And uh, every um, place is true mm -hmm. and also every character. But the story is like, uh, more in my head, is more like a dream when you dream uh, every part of the dream, it's true. You dream the real people mm -hmm. and uh, yourself, but uh, the dream is not true. And uh, a novel for me is the same thing. Okay. <laughs> I, th I think it's nice to go to uh, Jochen ten Haag because he, he's going to read something from uh, Life uh, on the Mississippi by Mark Twain. Um, and then we can talk about this a bit more, I think. I had myself called with a four o'clock watch, mornings, 
for one cannot see too many summer sunrises on the Mississippi. They are enchanting. First, there is the eloquence of silence, for a deep hush broods everywhere. Next, there is the haunting sense of loneliness, isolation, remoteness from the worry and the bustle of the world. The dawn creeps in steadily. The solid walls of black forest soften to gray, and vast stretches of the river open up and reveal themselves. The water is glass smooth, gives off spectral little wreaths of white mist. There isn't the faintest breath of wind, not stir of leaf. The tranquility is profound and infinitely satisfying. Then a bird pipes up. Another follows, and soon the pipings develop into a jubilant riot of music. You see none of the birds. You simply move through an atmosphere of song which seems to sing itself. When the light has become a little stronger, you have one of the fairest and softest pictures imaginable. You have the intense green of the masset and crowded foliage nearby. You see it, paling, shade by shade in front of you. Upon the next projecting cape, a mile off or more, the tint has lightened to the tender young green of spring. The cape beyond that one has lost its color. And the, first, and, and the furthest one, miles away under the horizon, sleeps upon the water, a mere dim vapor, and hardly separable from the sky above and about it. And all of this stretch of river is a mirror, and you have the shadowy reflections of leafage and the curving shores and the receding capes pictures, pictured in it. Well, that all is beautiful, soft and rich and beautiful. And when the sun gets well up and distributes a pink flush here and a powder of gold yonder and a purple haze where it will yield the best effect, you grant that you have seen something that is worth remembering. So this is Mark Twain, and yeah. he is an inspiration to you. Yes, of course. And then this book he wrote, it's a memoir. Um, so he was at the places that he describes. And I was wondering, would you have been ha able to write The Ain't Mountains if you hadn't gone to the mountains? No, never. <laughs> Because... Uh, uh... It's not just the the knowledge of a place, but uh, the, the the feeling that uh, he, the place uh, makes uh, to you. And uh, I think uh, that uh, for me it was important to to go there every every time that uh, I needed to to do it because uh, I I write on a notebook with a pen and. Uh, Every time that uh, I was uh, looking for something for a for a scene of the novel, I I went there on the lake uh, at that house because I knew that the places uh, um, could give, give give me something something new for the novel, but also staying uh, far because uh, and it was Joyce that uh, said that. Uh, Uh, nostalgia is an important feeling for a writer. When you are far from your places, you feel the, the real uh, feeling that you, uh, that you need for writing. Because you miss, you miss uh, your places mm -hmm. and uh, you love more. <laughs> and uh, you start uh, writing uh, uh, to to go back, and it's an important feeling for a writer. Do you recognize that? Oh yes, definitely. I try to avoid nostalgia, um, but it's not always possible. Um, and that's, that's why I actually distrusted uh, uh, my last book, The Heilige Rita, uh, because it, it came directly from, uh, these are memories from my childhood, when I crawled through the woods and Um, yeah, swam in this little stream behind my, my father's house and um, the further I 
grew from that, the more important it seemed. So that's what you probably call nostalgia. And um, finally, I, I, I decided not to uh, distrust this material anymore and write a book about a father and a son in, a, in an isolated farmhouse. Uh, but it took me a long time because you can decide not to distrust it anymore, but then there's still something inside which says, come on, man, that's, that's sentimental. Don't do that. Don't go there. Just write about the Ukrainian step. That's what you can do. Don't write about what you know so well. And b- b- because why do you dis- distrust that? Um, I wrote two books when I, in, the, in, the, in the early 90s which l- uh, leaned very heavily on my own experiences. And um, I discovered that my autobiography um, was a bit poor and not enough to uh, to rest an oeuvre on. Do you understand mm, what I mean? I doubt that in your case. But I don't. But I know. No, I know it's true. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> you can well, doubt it, but I, I will. Yeah. I will take it from you. Okay, but um, so I, 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 I sort of tried to, um, as in, a, 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 as by a miracle, I discovered fiction. Fiction, pure fiction, imagine worlds, which was for me uh, a great escape. I really enjoyed it, novel after novel. Uh, so this felt like going back to uh, something which I uh, happily left behind. Um, Are you but, happy but that you did that? I'm happy with everything now. Yeah? Yes. You may live, you may die, both are good. And also happy with the book that it became. Yeah. Yes, very actually. Um, and um, my father never played a big role in my uh, in my uh, work. Uh, I always considered him to be well. I compared him to a comma and my mother to a novel. Um, but now, finally, uh, I gave him the place which he deserves. Because he took care, uh, he took care of me between my 11th and my 16th, and I'm, uh, yeah, kind of grateful that he fed me. Um, so yes, I'm happy that I did that, and I am also happy that it's it's funny when you write an, on, it's it's like crawling back into a world which became too small. So you have to find this little rabbit hole and peek through that and try to, cr- try to crawl back into this world you had left as a child. Um, and I found that, yeah, I, I really enjoyed the experience. Yeah. And so much, it was like going under hypnosis. All these lost memories, all these forgotten experiences, all uh, this, uh, what you call in, in Dutch, zintuigelijkheid van een jeugd. Um, yeah, it was a, it was a, I enjoyed the process. We're going to get back to that subject later on, but I want to ask you as well, the parents in uh, Pietro's parents, are they based on people that you know? Mm, a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> on yes. who? I, maybe I don't really know my mother and father, but uh, uh, they are always a mystery to us. <laughs> Your parents? Yes. Yes, yes because... Uh, uh, we don't know anything about uh, their previous life. And uh, my mother was uh, 40 when uh, I was born. And she spent uh, uh, their uh, first 40 years uh, in, a, in countryside, in a big farm in Veneto. And uh, then uh, she married with my father and they moved uh, in Milano when uh, I was born. So 40 years uh, of life of my mother that I don't, uh, that I don't know. And uh, I just uh, knew uh, her uh, nostalgia, her uh, melancholia of, uh, of the country, of the land, of the animals, of the flowers. And uh, the book is also a way to understand better my parents. 
Do you understand them better after writing? Yes, I think that uh, a story starts uh, from a question or some questions, and uh, writing is a way to try to uh, find an answer. And what did you? What was the question, and what is the answer? Who my father was, mm -hmm. and uh, the the answer is the book. <laughs> <laughs> and what did you? Was there something that you learned that you did, or or find out that you wasn't that surprised you that you? Uh, yes, I think that uh, without surprising, uh, there uh, there uh, will be no reason to write. Because uh, if you know everything uh, that you will write, uh, it's very uh, boring. Spend, uh, spending two or three years of your life uh, doing something that you know very well. Uh, I like the idea that uh, writing is like exploring, so exploring yourself, but also exploring uh, your uh, relations, uh, relations uh, with others. And uh, in some pages, like... Uh, the pages that he read before uh, where Pietro go again on the mountains and he looks up and uh, he starts to think that he's doing the same uh, thing that uh, his father used to do. It, that's something that, uh, I, that happened to me. And... Um, they are the surprises of uh, writing a, a story like, like this. And if writing starts with the question for you both, in, after you finish the book, is the question answered, or is it just a piece of the puzzle, or does these que do these questions just keep on going? <laughs> I don't know <clears throat> if it starts with a question. Maybe for me it starts also with, with uh, an atmosphere, uh, countryside. Um, as I said before, space. I mean, uh, the, the, my previous novel, um, these are the names. Um, it started actually with the environment, the environment of the Ukrainian steppe. And that w I read a sentence in, in Milan Kundera's uh, beautiful uh, essay on, uh, on novel writing. Uh, on the novel, um, he asks himself what happened to adventure, one of the main great uh, novel themes uh, from the past. Um, I'm very happy with uh, with a book like The Eight Mountains because it's this is going back to to what the novel used to be uh, uh, an adventure. I mean, I, I found it reading it. I found it an adventure about an adventure. Uh, so I was very happy with it, and um, I mean, if you if you think of Moby Dick, for instance, of Don Don Quixote or um, uh, Heart of Darkness, these are novels which take place in an enormous amount of space, uh, and in, in in this in this as I said it before, but in this delta, I cannot find I find it difficult to find my adventure. So that's why I go to uh, Twente and uh, Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was, uh, that's maybe not so much a question, but the longing for adventure. It's mm. also a good starting point. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, I don't know what, uh, what question is answered, it's but I, it, it's, it's satisfied my need for, uh, for adventure. For adventure. Yeah. And do you think that will keep on going forever, your need for adventure? As long as I can walk, yes, <laughs> yes, walking, yeah, I'm walking more than writing, yeah, yeah. And for you, Paolo, will this, this, if you, you do have a question um, when you start, do you reckon they will be, are they answered, or will they remain? There is a big question at the end of a, of a book that is, uh, and now? <laughs> and <laughs> that's the same feeling uh, of a... Uh, summit. Um, the mountaineers uh, um, speak so often about the, the, the disappointment of the summit mm -hmm. because uh, you, uh, you, work, you work a lot and uh, 
uh, you fought a battle and uh, on the summit uh, you, you think uh, and now there is nothing here and then and you also have to go back yes <laughs> which is and bad for your knees <laughs> the same feeling yeah. of the yeah. last page uh, yeah. of, uh, of a novel for me <laughs> so um, you, are, you always have to, to, to start again when you're on the top of the mountain you always ask yourself how long sh- can I possibly stay uh, without letting my companions know that I'm actually bored <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you know that you spend three minutes Yes, you did, you you worked so hard to get there, and then you spend there one very little amount of time, and then oh, let's fuck, let's get back. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I started to avoid the the summit, yeah. and I just finished yeah. a small book uh, against uh, the the mountaineering. The title is uh, without uh, ne- with never going to the summit, mm-hmm. and uh, is inspired by a. Um, the Buddhist idea of pilgrimage. You know, our pilgrimage uh, have uh, always uh, uh, an end, like uh, Jerusalem or uh, the summit mm-hmm. of the mountains. And on the Alps, uh, we have a lot of crosses on the summits that I don't like. And uh, the, the, um, Why do you not like them? Uh, because uh, not, not for religion. Uh, I don't like uh, the idea that men uh, need to put something human, mm-hmm. a sign that uh, says, uh, I was here yeah. on the summit of, the, of a mountain, like a flag. The most important uh, Buddhist um, pilgrimage is around um, uh, Kailash, Mount Kailash. This is a holy, a holy mountain in Tibet. And uh, the pilgrimage is not going to the summit, but make a round circle around uh, the, the mountain. And I feel that is a um, more uh, respectful way to go but to the But you write that in your book as well. You say, I'm not, not, the, not a summit guy. I'm uh, just above the tree level, above, just above the yes. tree line. Yes. That's my... And your mother is fr- from the woods? Yes. I mean, the mother in the book, but I, I, I thought of you when I, wrote it, I read it. So, um, The mother in the book, <laughs> um, she's from the tree line, from under yes. the tree line, then... He is from up uh, above the tree line, and then the father is the one who. Yes, who because I think also that, uh, that that is a, um, a male way to see the life. To conquer was, something. Yes, yeah. to conquer everything. Um, the <laughs> in your job, in your life, mm. uh, it was my my father' way of life. Always a fight uh, against uh, someone or yeah. against himself. To, mm-hmm. to conquer something. And my mother's way of life uh, was uh, uh, trying to understand others and to, to love others. And uh, I think it's like uh, going around the going mountains. Around <laughs> If you love uh, a girl, uh, you don't want to go up on her head. <laughs> But maybe... Maybe go around <laughs> <Yeah>. it. <laughs> Interesting thought. I, mean, I, should, well, <laughs> I should try that. One. <laughs> yeah. I think as, uh, speaking about love, uh, uh, it's nice to go to the next uh, uh, fragment. It's a piece from um, the book you wrote as a, a Boekenweek geschenk, which is a, a, a very... Well, yes, tell pers- him about the Boekenweek. <laughs> it's a good pretty, idea. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not go there now, <laughs> uh, maybe later. But um, uh, a beautiful, a young, beautiful wife. Um, and we, we are going to the beginning that... Uh, Edward and Ruth, um, there are going to be a couple later on, but now we're uh, in the boat on their first date. And it was written by Tommy Wien. As darkness starts to fall, he is the first to climb into the boat. He reaches out to her. She seizes his hand and takes a giant step. He rows back, the current stronger than he had thought. In the darkness beneath the trees, he wants to stay right in midstream and correct as little as possible. It needs to be perfect. Wait a minute, she says after a while. She leans forward and places her hand on his. He stops rowing. Hear that? She whispers. So quiet. Not even a bird. Only the drops falling from the oars. Just before they touch the bank, 
he brings the left oar alongside and lets it rest in the water. Standing up, she says, permission to go ashore? They clamber up onto the bank and he ties the boat. She disappears between the tall, smooth trunks, her white hair fluorescent and enticing, a creature that brings misfortune to those who follow her song deeper and deeper into the woods. The English country garden belongs to the mansion further along, tucked away amid the trees. The windows are darkened. There's no sign of life. He'll buy it for her and look at it from a distance, from a distance each day by nightfall. An illuminated beehive. That's where he will live and make children with his glorious woman. One child for each room. She excites him incredibly. But he doesn't want to ruin it by being too greedy. By revealing his desperate longing. More than ever, he realizes now, being in love connects him with the boy he once was. With the first time. His mouth dry, his heart pounding. The first time of all first times that followed. He had never married and he'd never been with one woman for long. He had always remained a collector of first times. And now he is 42 and knows for a fact that everything has gone the way it's gone only in order to bring him to this girl. She laughs as she reappears among the trees, a light-footed heathen goddess. This is such a wonderful place, she says. She speaks rather softly as though the trees and the grass might hear. When she stands on tiptoe and kisses him, he has the confusing feeling that she went into the woods to consult with the others of her kind, nymphs like her, gathered around the black reflecting pool. Translated by Sam Garrett. Thank you. So when Edward falls in love, he is connected with the boy he once was. Um, and I, I read that. And then shortly after that, I read the beginning of the, the Batium, so the, the, this other book that mm -hmm. you wrote. And then there's a, there's a bit in that, and it is he wants to go to these mountains to connect, literally, to the boy that he was. And then I... Um, I was that was that was interesting for me to see both these characters connecting with with something that um, has passed, and then I was wondering why why did you want to describe that? Why is it important? Well, to that's I mean that? the, the the things that happen to you are the only things that you really possess. For the rest, you're empty-handed. Um, so I, I've, I've found it. I mean, this, this is this is what I'm made of, and these experiences, the, like like uh, Jochem just read, um, these experiences are important. I mean, when when spring comes, for instance, I mean, and they're, mostly they go by the via the nose. It's an olfactoric sensation. Uh, when spring comes, um, you, s you smell this cold air, and in between this cold air, there's a little layer of warmth, which is uh, spring coming. And I remember, I, I, having not growing up in, in, in the Netherlands, but uh, I only had that since I was 10, but I remember that when I, I had to leave. Uh, my, my mother, she was funny. She uh, put me on a school which was two hours away from, uh, from, uh, from our house. So I left home every morning at a quarter to six. And then I could smell that. Mm -hmm. Like it was very cold all winter and you guarded yourself against the cold. And then suddenly you, you, you sensed something's changing. And every year I have, when, when spring is coming, I have the same sensation, and which connects me to the boy I was. And this is the only thing I really possess is these, this very strong memory of spring coming. And mm. um, I never wrote about that, but um, it's, that's, it's, it's in an in a unimportant way important to me. Yeah. 
Do you have to say? I feel uh, I feel in my in the ch- in childhood or maybe in my childhood something very um, free mm-hmm. and uh, pure and uh, clear and uh, this feeling clear because uh, uh, your wishes my wishes when I was a child uh, was so uh, si- simple and clear I will be an astronaut or I will be a writer and uh, no doubt that, that uh, I can I can do it and and that's the freedom of a of a child you can uh, wish uh, whatever you want and uh, in in my personal crisis in the adult age I I missed so much that uh, that feeling to be to be free to wish uh, whatever I want so the 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 need to reconnect with uh, myself, uh, my with my childhood, mm-hmm. was uh, a needing a needing of freedom, and um, a needing of uh, uh, open my my future. So it's l- is it looking for lost time? Should no, that's, no? That's, that's 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 that's, poop, that's but <laughs> yeah, that ruins the feeling. Okay, and why? Uh, because the words are a bit too uh, bleak mm-hmm. for the experience. So I would never say that. Mm-hmm. Um, if, you can, if, it, yeah, if you can replace them? No, I can't. No? No, um, no I can't. I just, I just explained it. Yeah, I yeah. think so too. I think so too, but then... I find it interesting because we all have these... Uh, experiences I think I, I once smelled someone who smelled exactly like my grandmother 10 years after she died which is what was she t- my grandmother you died your, your and grandmother I, s- 10 I smelled years her oh yeah no but but not her but not <laughs> well, I thought <laughs> no. it was a terrible sensation <laughs> no, that <would> have been <laughs> <awful>. <laughs> no that would have been terrible no but somebody <laughs> you, you smelled just like my grandmother <laughs> no, 10 no, years was, after no, she died that was not what happened but then <laughs> <laughs> no, I smelled someone who smelled exactly yeah, okay, yeah, like yeah, her, and yeah. it, I, I still remember that. Well, you smell so many things, yeah. so I wonder why these 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 experiences are so important to us. What else do we have? I mean, and I, I'm, I'm repeating myself. Mm-hmm, um, that's okay. But this is this is what I really feel, which is the only thing that I can. Um, this is what I am. What I, what I consist of. This is what I'm made of. Um, so that's that's why they they're uh, uh, to someone else they're imp- unimportant, totally unimportant. But uh, the, but to me that's um, that's the first time of many first times that would uh, come. Do they become more important when you get older, or? Are there more of them when you get older? Well, as we turn slowly turn childish when we get older, it's probably getting more. Yes, probably getting more important. More important. Yes, we're returning to the child we were, and um, before, yeah, before we lose the words, it's important to 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 find words to uh, to describe these experiences. Is it the same for you that these these I know a man who lost his speech. Uh he's unable to speak um but he probably still has these experiences. So it's important before we lose the words that we find the right words. Yeah. Oh. I have to say that uh, I don't have children and uh maybe that's uh that's why I feel so connected to my to my own childhood. I think there is something that happens when uh, you become a mother. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, you you can't uh, you can't uh, be no more a, a child. But uh, uh, for me, it's different. I I always uh, feel like a son uh, and like a boy. I'm forty now. But mm-hmm. uh, uh, it's what I feel. 
But you have children. Do you, do you think that the connection has changed ever since you had children yourself? Oh, it's wonderful to re-experience your childhood with uh, when you have children. I mean, everything you, you see it happening the first time, and I can see uh, what what happens when when memories are uh, implanted in these children. You know this, you will probably remember this. And you try to, to give them as many um, of these positive, good, strong memories as possible. Uh, probably uh, it, it, it ends up the other way around. They only remember you shouting on the side of a football field like, I'm full now, I'm! Uh, they both play soccer. Ah. And that's what they probably remember. This old man with a red head, like, fuck. <laughs> but um, you try to do something else. Mm -hmm. And within trying, uh, with, yeah, then uh, it, something might happen. But I'm not so sure, actually. And that's, that's also false about many memories of your parents, that they probably also tried it, but what you remember are terrible things. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so, so we are deluded by memory, but... Yeah. Do you agree? Are we alluded by memory? <laughs> deluded by memory? Um, I don't know. I, I I feel like I live in my I live in my memories uh, all the time. Maybe that's because uh, I always write uh, since I was uh, 16, I think. I I spent uh, my whole uh, adult life uh, writing, and uh, it's like uh, um, swimming all the time in uh, your memories, living in your memories. And sometimes uh, I, I would like to be something different than a writer. Uh, a writer, once I wrote a, a very short story about uh, the back of a, of a girl. Uh, the, the main character was the back of, the, of that girl uh, because there was a girl that uh, always uh, talked to the, to the past of the past oh. and uh, I think that uh, the writer's life is like so and uh, sometime uh, I would prefer to be my, my, my bell and uh, looking Look forward, forward. <laughs> and, but I don't know maybe I, I, I have to change uh, my job. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you should, <laughs> but, but I can imagine that it's quite hard to always have to look back. That's terrible. <laughs> it's terrible. I mean, I, 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 when I was 32, I, um, I decided not to be so nostalgic anymore. And I thought, bloody hell, come on, I have a life ahead of me. Why should I always... Um, Mesmerized? Why should I always uh, contemplate things that happened? They weren't that important, and it was a clear decision. And uh, from that moment on, I lived. I, I turned from epimetas into prometas, and uh, it was the most happy decision of my life. Uh, and I was able to suddenly grasp the whole um, realm of fiction, which suddenly became uh, available to me because I wasn't so contemplating my own shabby life story and the things that happened and the things that hurt me and oh, it was disgusting. And I was very happy. I mean, and, and becoming Prometa saved my writing. In what way? Sorry? In what way? I just explained that. Mm. Yeah, but sorry. Uh, okay, but um, in what way? Um, I, I, I suddenly was able to write... Um, um, stories that weren't about myself anymore. I was able to write Joe Speedboat, which I, I, when I wrote it, I thought, well, it's, it's, it's a jolly story and it's, it's funny and uh, it's, it's straightforward and um, it has energy. Um, I doubted wh whether anyone wanted to read it because the previous three novels, nobody wanted to read it, but um, uh, living... Um, forward um, brought me another kind of literature, brought, my, brought me different books, brought me different stories. So um, um, 
and, and personally as well, which was good. I, I mean, I was, I was contemplating a girl which left me 20 years before, when I was 12. <laughs> Jesus Christ, grow up. <laughs> Which Fair was enough. still very important <laughs> to me when I was 32. I mean, that's mm-hmm. not a life. Maybe then it's time to yes. <laughs> live so for I was, uh, yeah. and, uh, and, and, and yes, uh, Greek mythology gave me a good, uh, gave me a good uh, um, uh, weapon. Yeah. Does it, the memories that you have of your parents, they're not accurate. You remember some things, some things you don't. Does it matter that these, me- these memories are not accurate? For writing? Um, no, probably not. No? No. No. No, I mean, these, these memories are just like your experiences. I mean, that, that this, this, is, this is what you work with. And it doesn't matter whether it was something else. It is what you remember and not something else. Mm, that's enough. Yeah, yeah, probably. But, uh, but I've, um, yeah. Do you agree? Oh, my memories are like uh, pictures. They are uh, <laughs> really, 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 really uh, vivid. And uh, uh, my mother, for example, is so happy that uh, I write. I wrote uh, this book because uh, she says that I, I remember everything. And uh, um, in the, in our life, in our family, she was uh, the character that. Uh, uh, could be uh, could remain uh, unseen is uh, like a, a woman destiny you you see <laughs> you always see this big man like my father that uh, uh, do a lot of things and uh, has a big body a big character and uh, our mothers are uh, in the shadow and mm. uh, maybe Something. Sometimes they 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 think that uh, nobody uh, see see them, mm-hmm. and uh, it was the the fear of my mother. And uh, when she read the book, uh, she she told me so. Uh, you saw me, mm. and uh, it was uh, one of the best uh, prizes for me. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Um, we're going to listen to Jochen ten Haaf. Again, <laughs> um, he's going to read something from um, uh, your book, The Eight Mountains. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a, a scene between, it's the moment that Bruno uh, uh, and Pietro, they've met, and then Bruno is teaching uh, uh, Pietro the words of the mountain. Going into, going into the mountains with Bruno had nothing to do with the peaks. Although we did follow a path into the woods, Climbing quickly for half an hour, we would at some point, known only to him, leave the beaten track and continue along other routes. Up a gorge, even, or through the thickest fur cover. It was a mystery to me how he got his bearings. He walked fast, following an internal map which indicated passageways, where all I could see was a collapsed bank or a scar that looked too steep. But right at the last moment, between two twisted pines, the rock would reveal a fissure that we could get a purchase on to climb. And a ledge, which had been invisible at first, would allow us to cross it with ease. Some of these trails had been first opened up with the blows of pickaxes. When I asked him who would use them, he would say, the miners, or alternatively, the woodcutters pointing out the telltale signs that I was incapable of noticing. The winding gear of a cable lift, rusted and overgrown with weeds. The earth that beneath a drier layer was still blackened by fire, where a charcoal works had been. The woods were littered with these excavations, mounds and ruins, which Bruno interpreted for me as if they were phrases written in a dead language. Together with his cryptic signs, he would teach me a dialect that I found less abstract than Italian. As soon as I was in the mountains, it was as if I would need to substitute the concrete language of things for the abstract language of books. Now that the things themselves were tangible and I could touch them with my own hands. The large, la brenga, 
the spruce, la pezza, the Swiss pine, la rula, an overhanging rock under which to take cover from rain, was a barma, a stone, a barrio, and so was I, Pietro, and I was very fond of that nickname. Every river cut a valley, and so was called a valley. Every valley had two sides with contrasting characteristics. An adret, nicely exposed to the sun, where there were villages and fields, and an enver that was damp in the shadow, left to the forest and the wildlife. But of these two, it was the reverse side that we preferred. It was about learning to, to, to read the landscape. The landscape is a kind of writing that uh, we, we can uh, learn to, to read. And uh, one thing that is uh, lost in translation is that uh, in, the Italian, uh, in, it, in Italian we have uh, every word is uh, male or female. Mm -hmm. And uh, in Italian uh, the names of the trees are uh, male. And in, in the dialect in Patois, now our Patois in Val d'Aosta, the trees are female, mm -hmm. so Ilarice la brenga. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Pietro feels that uh, a female name is uh, mm, uh, more... Uh, um, it's, it's better for a, for a, for a tree. And, um, and also... Agree? Yes. Yes? I think uh, that is a, that is a, there is a female uh, soul in, uh, in the trees. And um, another thing is that uh, uh, it was Emerson, uh, Thoreau's teacher, that uh, said uh, that uh, the words of nature are the words that we use for thinking. So uh, learning the words of nature is a way to uh, learn to think better. And uh, when Pietro learns that... Uh, Uh, story of uh, the part uh, in shadow of the mountains and the part in light, he also start to, to learn something about the human soul. Mm. And uh, that uh, also in his, friends, uh, in his friend uh, Bruno, there is a shadow part and a light part. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that At the beginning of my story in the mountains, I, I didn't have the words to describe it. The adventure to write a novel like this is also uh, to learn the, the, the right language to, to write the story. And uh, it was really a um, process full of joy for me, like, uh, like a child that uh, learned to speak Yep. Because uh, I was a boy from Milan. For me, a woods uh, was just a woods full of pines. And um, after a while, I learned that uh, there were no pines in my, in my wood, but uh, larch, spruce, mm. etc. <coughs> and, um, and maybe in some pages like this one, there is, you can feel this joy. Mm -hmm. This joy of the writer that is really happy to use uh, new words. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I found that, uh, especially what he just read, uh, you, could f you could feel the joy that, that you discovered and you thought, ah, yeah, well, I'm going. It, it made me think of uh, yeah, Annie Pruel. She's also very specific on, on the names of things. Things have names and. Everything has its own passport, and uh, in giving it a name, you're giving it uh, uh, a character, and it, be it means something. So that, I, I f that was a joy reading. Yeah. Yes. When I came to the Netherlands, I, um, I didn't know anything about the trees or the grasses or the flowers. Or, and it took me, and I always felt a bit, um, Until I was 30 years old, I, thought, I felt in, in exile in the Netherlands, and I always thought, well, I'm going back to this barren rock in the Caribbean, and, which I never did, of course. And then I decided to stay here and become Dutch. How do you become Dutch? Uh, so I, um, I uh, got hold of a, of a guide, a field guide, of trees and birds and everything. De basisgids Flora en Fauna van Nederland. Uitgegeven door de Stichting Natuurmonumenten. 
heel belangrijk boek. En ook, uh, I have to say this in Dutch, maar ook geschreven door uh, verborgen filosofen. Want ze schrijven dingen als... De waterral leidt een verborgen bestaan. Je ho- ziet hem nooit. Horen doe je hem eerder. En dat is zo spannend. Ja, ja dat klopt, ja. So I learned, I learned the tree, uh, what the tree, what, what is a poplar, what is a large, what is a, a birch. So I learned all the trees and the grasses and the name. So I, uh, I treated my own country as you treated uh, uh, your mountains as a foreigner learning a new language. Yes. And that there is great joy in that. Mm. And that's, that's also part of the joy of writing is uh, researching. Um, for, once it took me... Maybe a week, I mean not a whole week, not 24 hours a day, but a lot of research. Uh, I knew that this thing near to a, a, a stairway had a name. It must have a name. It's impossible that there are things without names. And after a week, I found a word. It was the word baluster. Balaustra. <laughs> Balaustra. <laughs> yeah, he knows it. <laughs> I had to search for it. <laughs> yeah, so, that, but there was such incredible joy in finding that word and mm-hmm. you can place it just like this missing stone like <laughs> now the construction is good yeah. and uh, you know my friend Remigio that uh, teaches me the, the, the words uh, of the mountains uh, told me that uh, he w- when he had to learn Italian because uh, as a child he used to speak just dialect mm-hmm. and dialect uh, is full of words for uh, trees, uh, works uh, part of the of the mountains, but uh, uh, it's very poor uh, of uh, words for uh, feelings mm-hmm. and for love. Yeah. So once he fell in love with a girl from, from a city, from Reggio Emilia in Italy, mm-hmm. that uh, went up uh, in the small village in mountains for vacation, and uh, they had uh, this uh, short uh, love story, and uh, when uh, she uh, went uh, down in the city, she wrote uh, a letter to Remigio. And uh, with this letter uh, in, uh, yeah. <laughs> in hand, uh, he, he took that uh, he wasn't able to, to write back, back to, to his girlfriend. Mm. Because, yes, he didn't have the words. Yes. But no words, no trees, no rocks, no, no streams. Yeah. Uh, no. To, <laughs> no. <laughs> but then when Bruno asked... But did he learn the language finally? He started to, to, to read. Oh, yeah. To read, so he had to learn the language of Petrarca yeah, in order yes. to write her back. Mm-hmm. As uh, uh, every of us, he started to copy uh, <laughs> love poems, <laughs> and yeah. Uh, yeah. he learned uh, Italian like yeah. so. <laughs> but because when when Bruno teaches Pietro the words, he invites him into his life, and then they can build a friendship. I think. Yes, yes, it's true. Uh, but uh, I think in a couple of. Friends, uh, there, uh, there is a son, always uh, one that is the teacher, and uh, the other is uh, uh, the student. And I, d- I don't know if the roles uh, no. can be changed. No. For, for me, I always be the the, the student yes. of my of my friends. And uh, what that's why I then? like uh, all the older friends, and uh, I don't like to be the teacher. And what do you think about Bruno and Pietro? Do they do they swap roles, or is Bruno still the teacher? The I end? think uh, he's, uh, he's still the teacher. Yes? yes, until until the end of the story. That's not what I thought when I read it. No? So that's my individuality as a reader. I I think it's different. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but that's that's interesting. Yeah, I think the roles change, and that's why it uh, becomes unclear. Uh, and that's why why conflict appears. That's what I got from your book, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that in friendship there's always someone who is teacher and student? Do you think no? No, no, because that that that. Um, I found a friend uh, maybe seven or eight years ago, which is a very, very dear friend, and there's nothing there's actually it's it's so amorph that we don't have roles we're just friends it's mm-hmm. a, it's it's an amazing friendship um, there's no conflict 
I desire nothing he possesses. Um, I just admire him, um, and and that's like and I use irony a lot and and sarcasm. And mm-hmm. when I do that, he looks at me as if uh, as if something's wrong with him because I do that. So it's a very pure friendship. And I would have never thought that when I was in my thirties or twenties that that something like that could exist. So um, there are many forms because I also have very competitive friendships, mm-hmm. which are also great. It's good fun. Yeah. But you need different friendships. Yeah, this one, this one amazes me still. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you have a friendship like that? That amazes you still? Oh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe... Do you have friends? Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> that's, that's a good answer. I also, I also, I also have lost some friends. Uh, mm. My my friendship are always very short, mm. and um, uh, I I dream of a of a friendship that can uh, last for a uh, whole life, but uh, it's not my my experience, and. Um, I have a quote in my pocket that I can read. I I keep it uh, here for mom- art moments like mm. this one, and uh, it's uh, um, by Peter Mathiesen. Peter Mathiesen was an American writer. Snow, you know Le- him? Snow Leopard. Yeah, the Snow Leopard uh, was my last uh, favorite book, mm-hmm. and uh, last year I I um, follow. Is a step in uh, northwest of Nepal, the same, uh, the same uh, road of uh, the snow leopard, and um, uh, it's an answer uh, to the question why we go to the mountains. And uh, he writes, uh, the secret of, of the mountain is that the mountains simply exist, as I do myself. The, ma- the mountains have no meaning; they are meaning. The mountains are. I ring with life, and the mountains ring, and when I can hear it, there is a ringing that we share. Hmm. <laughs> Now, song? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's no music. Hmm. In both your books, the friendship plays between two men. Yes. But then you already <laughs> brought up the role of women in your book. And I was wondering, could Bruno have been a woman? Would it have mattered? No, it was... Uh, it would be uh, impossible. Impossible. Uh, I wrote a lot <laughs> about... Uh, I wrote a lot about uh, girls. Mm-hmm. My first uh, three books were about girls. And uh, for uh, these uh, years, uh, and uh, when... Uh, uh, I met Tommy also years ago. I was in Italy like the the the, the man who knows uh, girls. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> It was uh, why I all in my my uh, adolescence I was uh, always the, the the friend of of the girls. Mm-hmm. Uh, Because uh, I, I, I was able to write, and uh, when I fell in love with, uh, with them, I started to write letters, and uh, girls were like, oh, oh, you are so sensitive. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> maybe I can tell you my secrets, and uh, <laughs> you, can, you can have uh, any suggestion. And so I was the friend, uh, the friend of the girls, and uh, I can say that Bruno... Couldn't be a girl. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, I was wondering that because because uh, you also said in an interview that um, men friendships are lacking from literature. It's a forgotten subject. So I wanted yes. to ask you why is is it important to write about friendship and then particularly about men's friendship. Because I think that in our uh, time uh, there is uh, uh, great uh, loneliness in being a man that I don't find uh, in uh, women now, in this moment. Um, 
I see that men are so lonely without uh, relation, relations outside the, out, the, of the, out of the family. And uh, in our old books, in classics, uh, we always had uh, friends, male friends. In our uh, contemporary um, literature, we always have uh, love, family. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like um, our uh, social relations are uh, lost now. And uh, I think it's part of uh, the human crisis of uh, our time. So um, one of the first uh, words that uh, people spent uh, for my book was the word classic, classical. Mm -hmm. It was uh, like a classical story. And they, I think that was because uh, um, the friendship between men is a classical team. Um, I miss it. I'm very sick of love and family <laughs> in our novels. <laughs> mm -hmm. I would like more... Uh, more friendship, and any proof that uh, that Tommy quote before uh, was uh, the author of a story that was so important for me to write this one. That was uh, Brokeback Mountain. Mm -hmm. Maybe you remember of the movie? Yes, of course. But it was a short story by Annie Proulx. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that story, there is something very important. Uh, some reader uh, think that uh, Pietro may be gay. Mm -hmm. And uh, it uh, could be true. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't really know. But in that uh, story, uh, Brokeback Mountain, um, love and friendship uh, between men aren't uh, so different. No. And the same kind of uh, intimacy between uh, human beings. And uh, the only place where this in intimacy or was possible, mm -hmm. was the mountain. So that's the, the, the strong idea that I uh, took from uh, that book and used for, for mine. Because in a way it is quite sad that if we see intimacy between men portraited, that we think, oh, they must be gay. But who thinks, I mean, we? Well, who? not we, but, yeah. but, but, but people, but, but I've read it more often mm. about the book, that they, they that people assume that, and you get that question? Yes. Uh, I had uh, last year, for the first time after I don't know how many, how many years, uh, spent uh, one month in a tent, not the whole day, but uh, every night, with a, um, with a friend, with a, <laughs> with a boy, Nicola, who is my another great friend. And uh, the first days were uh, so hard because uh, sleep in a tent with another man, mm -hmm. uh, it was something that uh, maybe was possible when I was uh, 16, mm -hmm. not uh, at fort. And after a couple of weeks, uh, I started to enjoy this uh, kind of uh, intimacy, the possibility to speak with a good friend in a tent um, <laughs> uh, I think uh, there is something that I miss in, of uh, the, the relation with the other men that maybe people used to have uh, during a war or going to the mountains. Building or, a house. Or building a house. That's yeah. why the, 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 the art of my, my story is building two men that build a house. It's like a sleep in a tent. <laughs> Yeah, what you great think? details also. With the, I, I like I like the way that you really teach us how to build a house. I mean, you can you can build a house after having read your book. <laughs> I know how to do it now. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, it, I like the details about that. Yeah, and that's what what I mean. That's what f good friends are friends with with whom you share physical experiences, like playing rugby, building houses, and. It's, um, it's difficult to maintain a good friendship in bars and cafes mm. without actually having a fight together or doing something physical. Yeah. Yes, I agree. The physical way to be together. And then that's also the reason why they don't speak so much. Because they do things with uh, their bodies. Yeah.
we do things with our body. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> um, because I, while well, reading, um, I felt sorry for the man in both your books because of what you said. Because I can imagine it must be lonely sometimes to be a man. And, <laughs> and you're, some people have described the men in your book as well as the losers of globalization. What do you think that's... <laughs> I've, I've read it somewhere, but do oh, you yes, agree yeah, with that? Or do you... No, uh, funny, yeah. Funny thought. I never thought of that. Um, the losers of globalization. No? <laughs> um, they live in Geesteren. Yes. And I'm going to tell them in Geesteren. <laughs> Do you know what the, what the critique considers you? <laughs> no, but um, uh, these these people are eternal. They are, they don't have. A, they never heard of the word globalization, so they cannot be the loser of it. Mm-hmm. Um, no, I. I um, I think I describe, I try to describe something which will always be there. Mm -hmm. Life uh, in the periphery. Um, There will always be a center and there will always be the people who are forgotten. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, when I'm, when I'm, I I really enjoy uh, going to Hu Dynasty in Geesteren, which is a, a Chinese restaurant. And I talk to people there, and, and when I when I tell them that oh, I have to go back, so I can't drink too much, and you're going all the way to Amsterdam, which is one hour and forty minutes, but it's like crossing an ocean. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's the also in a small country like the Netherlands, the the distance between the center and the periphery is enormous. I agree, and um, they always feel neglected. And that that's also part of life in the periphery, that you feel neglected, and they they feel they're these people in Amsterdam in the Lamar Theater van Joop van der Ende, in their red chairs, they feel like they're quite something, mm. and um, they never go to something like this. Um, but I wouldn't consider them losers, no. No, they can easily do without evenings like this. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Who are the winners of glo- globalization? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> you, Paolo Cognetti, you <laughs> <Me>? are the <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm the winner. <laughs> but then, of course, in a thing, in in a current society, there's people who benefit more than others. Of course. Mm. True. There's a final question before we, I'm turning to the. Uh, to the room. Um, In your book, I thought that women might be better equipped to our day and age. Mm. Do you agree? Yes. Yes. Why? Um, Because they they are well trained to um, asking help and and I I always uh, saw in my mother and the, the women of my childhood uh, this uh, ability to um, to to watch to others and to see the small things and uh, my father and the men uh, like him uh, were uh, like uh, blind people mm-hmm. unable to to see to see me and to see um, the small problems, the small gestures. And uh, that's why uh, women are more uh, able in, in, in problems, because problems are about uh, uh, staying with others and uh, uh, have help from others. And... Um, also in, uh, in solitude. 
And uh, that's at, at the end of the book when um, Pietro's mother is getting older. He says, um, he thinks, uh, my mother doesn't want to, to, to get old alone. Uh, she always has uh, his, uh, her friends around there. And, uh, and Pietro knows that uh, he's not like, uh, like uh, his mother. And uh, uh, he's more like his father. And uh, maybe he will be always uh, more alone than, than that woman. Mm. That's my answer. Mm. <laughs> Do you like to react? For? Um, no, I have no idea. I know I'm, I'm, every time I uh, go into this discussion about women and... Uh, men, I uh, end up in terrible trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd rather uh, neglect the topic. Okay. Um, no, I don't, and, and I, I, f I find it difficult. I mean, here's a man, a very sensitive man, who's, uh, who knows his way into the hearts of women telling that actually men aren't able to do that, which is funny, it's a contradic uh, contradicts uh, um, I, I, I probably surround myself with very sensitive men, um, men who are perfectly uh, capable of dealing with uh, modern questions uh, which, has to do, which have to do with feelings and emotions and uh, they take care of children. Mm -hmm. Which is a, yeah, a terrible job, but we do it, um, and we probably do it better. So you see, there I go again. No, <laughs> so, okay. So, 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 no, um, but no. That, so I find it, I find it a bit of, a, yeah. No, I'm not, I'm not completely convinced by the topic. That's okay. Yeah. Then let's uh, uh, ask. Do you for have someone to take care of your child? <laughs> Myself and my boyfriend, I think. Okay, yeah, well, yeah. So we're together, good. so hopefully. <laughs> good, good, good. Yeah. Is there someone who wants to give us a question? I see two over there. Sophie is coming towards you with the microphone. Um, we read the book with our reading room. And we were discussing about um, page 165, chapter 9. <laughs> <laughs> Which book is it? Is it Tibet or...? The, seven, the, eight, uh, the Eight Mountains. And there you met this uh, man in the Himalayas who is carrying his uh, chicken. And uh, he said to you, oh, I see you are... Um, traveling the journey of the eight mountains. And we have one mountain, Sumero, uh, which is another way of traveling. Uh, I thought that that was the meaning of it, that you can travel your journey through life on two ways. But uh, can you explain something about this, the two different ways? The one is around the eight seas and the eight mountains. Yes. And the other one is straight up just one mountain. Yes. Um, it was the ancient might of the nomadic way, the nomadic life and the, 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 the one that uh, uh, travels and the one that uh, stays in a place and uh, have roots in that place. And the ruthless people like Pietro that uh, continue to, 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 to look for, um, for a town, a mountain, uh, a river to, to belong. And um, one of my favorite books uh, as a teenager was uh, a novel by Hermann Hesse, uh, not Siddhartha, but um, Narcissus and Goldmouth. <coughs> Do you, do you know that, uh, that book? Yes. Narcissus was a, a monk in, uh, in Germany during the Middle Age, and uh, Goldmouth was an, er an artist, an orphan that grew up uh, in that uh, monastery, 
and uh, became the best friend of uh, Narcissus. And uh, after uh, some years, uh, um, Goldmouth discovered in himself the, 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 the call of the artist. And so he knows that he has to, 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 to leave that place and uh, start uh, knowing the world, the cities, the women, the men. And uh, sometime he, he come back to the, mon to the monastery to visit uh, his old friend Narcissus. And uh, it's like they are, uh, um, the both are uh, uh, looking for um, their, uh, the, the sense of their life. But uh, the travel of Narcissus, of, of the person, of, Rem of my friend Remigio, of Bruno in the novel, Uh, the, the travel uh, of someone that uh, stays is a travel, uh, is a different, uh, is a different travel in, uh, in the time, in the mind, in the memory. Uh, one can uh, travel a lot also staying <laughs> in, a, in a cage, in a room, in, on, on a mountain. And so they are two destinies of to Hermanesse used that word uh, wanderer. I like so much the idea of a, of a life uh, like a uh, travel to, to wandering, to, to look uh, for uh, your place and uh, your sense in this uh, world. Thank you. There's another question over there. Let's see. Yeah, I had a question. Um, in the Eight Mountains, there is, an, there is a scene that um, the parents of Pietro wants to take uh, Bruno out of the mountains and actually put him, give him an education, bring him to the city. And in the end, the, the, the father of Bruno, he stops it. Yeah. And Bruno spends the rest of his life in the mountain. Do you think in the end that was the better decision for Bruno or would he have perfectly also a good life? When he grew up in the city, did he belong in the mountains, or what is your thought about that? Oh, I think that the better decision for Bruno will be the will be giving him the freedom to choose for his future. But he he doesn't have this freedom. So uh, the big difference between Bruno and Pietro is that uh, uh, Pietro is free to choose. <coughs> and And Bruno is not. Oh, please wait. Yes, I think that uh, maybe uh, if he if he went to, for a while uh, to school and to see another uh, another world like uh, the, like the city, maybe at the end, uh, maybe the end uh, wasn't uh, like so. So, I have here two questions. So you use a lot of uh, comparison between Bruno and Pietro as Bruno being grounded and Pietro being ruthless. And it seems like there is a bit of the black and whiteness here. And throughout the book, they kind of remain being the same as, as they were. Uh, but you yourself said that you feel split. You feel split between the mountain and the city. And I yeah. think a lot of us, in reality, we are a bit split. We are not all lost and we are not completely grounded. We're finding our way somewhere in the middle getting those puzzles of us, they are more integrated and less. And didn't you have a feeling that, that they could also have been like that? That Pietro could have been a bit more grounded and that maybe Bruno could have had a bit more willingness to, to go and to, to know how to count, to be a bit better in business, to have a bit more of liking towards the city. Mm -hmm. uh, so was it intentional? Or have they just been born like that in your head? Oh, my only intention was uh, to, um, uh, to do a good portrait of this great friend that I have. And uh, there is uh, really 
anything of uh, fictional. There is something fictional in the story, but uh, there is anything fictional in the characters. So um, it's not easy to befriend of a, of a person like Bruno, like Remigio, because they, they don't speak, uh, you can't move them. Uh, in 10 years of friendship, uh, I never... Uh, um, I, could, I couldn't uh, have my friend in my house in Milano, for example, or uh, have a trip together, uh, but uh, just uh, stay up there on the, uh, his fucking mountain. <laughs> 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 And uh, so that's, that's why Bruno is Bruno, is uh, uh, just for, uh, for my friend. Room for one more question, so I saw one over there the, in the white church. Yes, please. Thank you. Hello. Um, at the beginning of the conversation, uh, you were talking about uh, uh, solitude and uh, finding it uh, by going into the wild. I, um, I was thinking that maybe uh, uh, it's, not, uh, it's a bit uh, simplistic thinking of it in terms of uh, solitude uh, because um, depending on, on how you look at it, uh, we might go to the nature to find a lost connection. So we might, be, uh, uh, we might have feeling of solitude in a city w between people um, because uh, we have lost that connection to nature. Um, so uh, for me, uh, thinking of it in terms of solitude is a bit mm, too simple, because if you want to be alone, then um, you could yeah, close yourself in a room. Why to go to the nature? Uh, maybe, uh, so could you, to both of you, could you, maybe explain that a little bit, a little better, maybe, yeah, what do you think about it? What, what I like about uh, the Eight Mountains is the idea that it could have been written in 1900. Um, there's hardly any place for uh, m uh, modern uh, equipment There are no screens in the book, hardly any. Is, is there a mobile phone in the book? Oh, just um, one page. Yes, probably <laughs> so, um, which I like. So that there's, there's this, um, this idea of uh, that it could have been set in a, in a, in a whole different uh, time, which I like about the book. And... It's it's uh, there, oh yeah I know where it is I know where it is actually in the book because um, it says there is actually there are places where your telephone has no connection yes and <laughs> which is which is um, such a relief I went to to Ukraine as I said and I uh, I um, I asked a Cossack to 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 drive me around the, the the steppe because as coming from the Delta I had no idea of space. Um, he said, well, here's your horse. It's called Natasha. I said, what do I do with a horse? And he said, well, you're mounted. And then we drove in a step. And uh, at the end of the day, I drove 60 um, uh, kilometers on a horseback one day, which was fantastic. And my telephone had no connection. And um, which is, and after that, we sat in the, in the step and we, we made a fire and we drank uh, 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 something. And uh, he said, you, my friend, you you are now a Cossack, a honorary Cossack. And so I, was, I became honorary Cossack uh, in a place where, um, where I could not call my, uh, my friends and say, well, I'm, I'm a honorary Cossack now. <laughs> We see a picture of it, and we, which is very, very nice to experience. Um, and loneliness in a city uh, is never... I mean, you, you can be very lonely behind a... Uh, 
it, it, a screen of your computer of your, uh, or your uh, uh, cell phone, but it's different. It's this physical loneliness, like if something happens to me now, I'm lost, which is fantastic. And it's not, it, it doesn't really have to do with uh, going back to nature or something. Uh, that's not, I mean, nature is not really my thing. As, as Gottfried Baumann said, nature is a nice thing, but you need something to drink with it, <laughs> which I, uh, I, I agree to. Um, so that, that's, that's um, uh, it's more that, that every now and then you want to detach from modern life. And uh, modern life with all these... Uh, uh, breathtaking, nerve-wracking uh, devices, which take your energy. Uh, that's more. I think that that's more the direction which I meant, anyway. Paolo. Yes, I was thinking about uh, that uh, famous uh, lines uh, that uh, Chris McCandles uh, wrote uh, in his uh, journal. It wasn't a journal, but uh, the last pages of uh, a book that uh, he, he was reading. And uh, he, um, he wrote a, fl um, a Flaubert quote from, uh, from a novel of Flaubert that said, uh, happiness is true only when shared. Uh, this, and they, was, they were his last line after uh, three months of uh, solitude in the forest in Alaska. And I, I know that feeling, because uh, it's true that uh, nature is full of life, like uh, my dog, and uh, I can also spend uh, the rest of my life with a dog. But uh, uh, we don't have uh, words to share, to share happiness. And uh, I think that uh, we are uh, human beings also because uh, we have uh, words and uh, we speak. So um, after uh, weeks or uh, months of solitude, I miss uh, really much, uh, <laughs> also with lucky, <laughs> I miss really much uh, someone uh, uh, that, uh, that can speak with me. True. Uh, Thoreau, when he was in Walden, um, which is iconic loneliness, he went to have dinner with his mother almost every night. So. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. And uh, I like so much a quote from Thoreau from uh, Walden that uh, says, uh, in my house uh, I had uh, three chairs. First one for solitude, second one for friendship, and the third one for society. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would like to thank you both very, very much for being here tonight with us. Um, you. Your books are for sale uh, outside, so if you hadn't read them yet, please do. Um, and maybe you'll hang around to sign them? Sign them, oh yes. Would you? <laughs> yeah. uh, and join us for a drink later on in the valley. Um, and before uh, we're going to give them a really big applause, uh, we're going to listen to Jochem ten Haag for one last time. Thank you. That evening, I struggled to get to sleep. It was excitement that kept me awake. Mine was a solitary childhood, and I wasn't used to doing things with others. In this respect, too, I believed I was just like my father. But that day, I had felt something, an unexpected sense of intimacy that both attracted and frightened me, like an opening into an unknown territory. To call myself, I sought for a mental image. I thought of the river, of the pool, of the small waterfall, of the trout that moved their tails to remain stationary, of the leaves and twigs that flowed elsewhere, and then of the trout darting to meet their prey. And I began to understand a fact, namely that all things for a river fish come from upstream, waiting for things to come. If the point at which you immerse yourself in the river is the present, I thought, 
then the past is the water that has flowed past you, that which has gone downstream and where there's nothing left for you. Whereas the future is the water that comes down from above, bringing dangers and surprises. The past is in the valley, the future in the mountains. This is how I should have replied to my father. Whatever destiny may be, it resides in the mountains that tower over us. Thank you very much. Thank you.